2 Corinthians chapter 5. So this is a, an interesting text, and one of the reasons it's interesting is because uh, Paul's going to lay out the, really how ephemeral or temporary our lives are, that, we are that, that our bodies were not built to live forever, and he's going to relate it to a tent. Now, that's what Paul's trade was. Paul made tents. He understood them. He understood the construction of them, and he understood they were temporary. They were not structures that you'd want to live in. We see it all over our own land with, with uh, homeless people kind of communities that crop up, and they all have, you know, they, and they put tents up. Tents are fine structures to live in over a weekend, or maybe even a week if you're going camping, and it's nice weather, but they're not meant to be a permanent structure. So he starts talking about how temporary or ephemeral our lives are. He says, for we know that our earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So what he's talking about right there is the fact that you're going to have a new body. Now, this passage is all linked together with the fear of the Lord, all right? That is really the title of the sermon is walking in the fear of the Lord. And in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So one of the ways I fear the Lord is I know that this tent I'm in is temporary. It's not a permanent home. It's going to perish. And, And I know, amen. And at some point, when it gets put in the ground or however you choose to be handled after you pass away, someone's gonna say, out of the scriptures, out of Ecclesiastes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And walk away from that spot that they put you in and with a stone over you. Like, we are not built in these bodies to live eternally. We're just not. And it's partly because we've sinned and we broke our relationship with God. So our bodies are broken and they break down. And everybody knows, if you have a time where you ask for prayer requests, one thing we all offer, ask for prayer for is what? Physical problems. Back issues, issues of all kinds of stuff, right? And so we know we have this tent, and we know it's temporary. But what, what is said here, because we need to fear the Lord and realize that our bodies, which we need to take good care of, are not our, each, our home. We need to work on our other areas of our lives, right? You've got a soul. You've got a spirit. Some people think those are one and the same. Some people see those as different. I would lean to the tripartite category, but you've got to take care of your spiritual person, right? People spend lots of time, lots of money, lots of energy taking care of their physical bodies. Most times when the year flips over, we make a New Year's resolution that has something to do with our physical bodies, right? You've all said, I'm going to lose 10 pounds. Haven't you said that? We've all said that. Or something along those lines. I hope when you make those resolutions, if you make them, that there's spiritual ones you make. I want to get through the Bible in a year, or I want to study this book of the Bible, or I finally want to understand this concept about God, or I want to finally walk in holiness in this area of my life, or I want to find somebody to pray with, or whatever. Those should be on that list too. And Paul's saying, you've got to understand your body's a tent. It's not permanent. But the good news is when this tent, this physical body is torn down, you have a building from God, a house. Now look at the comparison. Do you want to live in a tent or do you want to live in a house? I don't know. Last night I'm glad I lived in a house, right? You wake up and I walked outside this morning probably at 645 and went, It's a little nippy, you know, and I'm glad I have, you know, it's nice to have a house and have some warmth. And he says, you got a house not made with hands, in other words, made by God. It's from God, made by him, eternal in the heavens. And it says, for indeed, in this house we groan, like this current tent, our house, longing to be clothed with our dwelling in heaven. And as much as we have put it on, we will not be found naked. All right, there's this concept that in heaven we will have a new glorified body. 
Now, you may say, where is this found in Scripture? And I'd say it's found in a lot of places. Um, I'm going to go to a very interesting verse in Job, Job chapter 19. And this is something you should know. Like, I hope you write these verses down. I hope you commit them to memory. Because this is an excellent defense for the resurrection, okay? Job, they say, was likely written at the same time as Abraham was alive, which would put it 2,000 years before Christ, which would put it as the oldest book in the Bible, all right? Not that it covers the oldest period of time, but written the oldest, right? Genesis starts in 1400. Even though it covers creation, it starts many hundred years later. I kind of lean to that Job interpretation that he was a contemporary of Abraham. That being the case, listen to what he says in chapter 19. All right? Think about Christ, think about the resurrection, and think about how this all applies. Verse 25. For as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, how would he know that? Well, God told him. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. And, And that's exactly what will happen in eschatology. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. Okay, so that means he's going to get a new body to see God with. Whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, not another, my heart faints within me. He's saying here, he knows his his Redeemer lives, and at the end of time he's going to take his stand on the earth... And after he has died, he will get a body that he will see his Redeemer with. That's, that's, that's your new body, right? And if you go back to 1 Corinthians, just before 2 Corinthians, in chapter 15, he says very clearly in verse 54, talking about our bodies, for this perishable must put on the imperishable, And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, O death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? You see, that idea that we are going to physically, bodily resurrect one day is not only in Job and not only all through the scriptures, but it's acutely highlighted in 1 Corinthians 15 where it talks about the resurrection of Christ. Now what's interesting is angels are all created beings. But they aren't one race. Humanity created in the image of God are all one race. We come from Adam and Eve. We are all related. So we needed somebody to step into our human race and be our kinsman redeemer, all right? And the fascinating thing is, is that's why when Christ died as one of us, we are all interrelated and he could die for us in a way that nobody else could. That's why he had to be born of Mary. And that's why he is the first fruits of the resurrection. In other words, he's the first to be physically bodily resurrected and so will you be. For indeed, we are in this tent, we are groaning, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. In other words, we want to have our new glorified body. Every time you have a pain in your body, it reminds you that this body is not forever, it's not for long, okay? Okay? And even right now, all kinds of sickness going through the church and the school. Well, it's January. That's what we do in January, right? We all get sick. And the other day I came home and went, man, I got to rest. I told Jen, I said, "I'm, I'm fighting something off. You know, you can just tell. Your body's fighting something off. And you just, you just feel it. And you think, man, I'd like my glorified body that I would never have to face this again. And he says, we want to be clothed, we want to be clothed. So now he, 
Christ, who prepared us for this very purpose is God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, and who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. So what that is, is that's a down payment. The Spirit is given to you to say, I'm going to come back and resurrect you and take you to be with me in heaven, right? It's like if you go somewhere and you're making a purchase and they say, you got to put a down payment down. Well, you put your down payment down, and that means you're going to come back and you're going to make sure and procure that item, and that's what the Holy Spirit is. And it says that in Ephesians, and that's the Ephesians verse that we uh, want to put up now in chapter 1. Um, and I want to read for you, all right? In him, that's in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him, in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with the view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. So you're sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise, who's given to you as a pledge of our inheritance. You are dead in your trespasses and sin. You are made alive by the Holy Spirit, spiritually, and he is your pledge to say, you're my child, right? I'm coming back for you. I'm coming back to get you. You know whose are yours, right? You can go to a group and see, if you have kids or grandchildren, you can see hundreds of children or grandchildren in a room. And who do you see? Yours. You see yours, don't you? All the other ones are nice, but you know where yours are. And you see what yours are doing. Because that's how God's wired us. God's the same way. He's like, you have the Holy Spirit. I know where you are, who you are. I'm coming back for you. I sometimes got worried when I was a kid that what if God, like, you know, forgot me? You know, what if I, I was like the one he was like, oh, yeah, that kid. I'm, uh, yeah, you know. He's not going to forget you. He knows you. You're his child. He loves you. He's going to return. He's going to take you to be with him. That could be through the rapture, and that could be through your passing. And we do not mourn as people who have um, no hope. We mourn as people that know that people, when they believe, are absent from the body and present with the Lord. So we fear the Lord because we know that we live in a temporary body. We want to take care of it. We want to realize that our spirit and soul are what we need to focus on. Therefore, being obvious of good, church, uh, good courage, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, all right? So he's saying that while we're here in this body, we're, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith and not by sight. So he's saying here that now we got to realize you're in this body, you're walking on this earth, and how do we conduct ourselves? We conduct ourselves by faith. We walk by faith. We trust the Lord. We make our decisions by faith. Uh, we talking to somebody yesterday about when churches should get together and when they shouldn't get together and all these things. And I was like, you walk by faith, right? Even this morning, it was inclement weather. You guys came here because you walk by faith. Some people don't feel that they could, and we understand that. But it says, it says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is or he exists and that he re is a rewarder of those who seek him. If you seek God, he will reward you for that. And you've got to believe that. And so he says here that while we're on this earth, we walk by faith and not by sight. All right? I read yesterday that in 2024, 42% of the world are going to the polls to vote in leaders. I did not know that. I did not know that. Pakistan, the European Union, obviously us, all kinds of nations. There's a lot that could happen in 2024. A lot could shake up, okay? So how do you walk? Uh... Verse 7, by faith, not by sight. But what if this happens? How are we going to walk? By faith. We're going to live by faith. We're going to walk by faith. We're going to know that we please God through faith. We're going to do that because we fear God. 
we're going to be of good courage. Verse 8, I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body, to be at home with the Lord. So he's saying here, if you're absent from the body, you're at home with the Lord. Therefore, verse 9, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be, ple- uh, to be pleasing him. So he's saying we walk by faith, we please the Lord. That's who we please, right? We, we ask the Lord to bless what we do. We ask what we're doing to please the Lord. Years ago, there was a worship song that was kind of this idea of the audience of one that we sing to the Lord, right? And that we should live to the Lord. And whatever we do, in word or deed, do it all unto the Lord. It's the Lord Christ you are serving. It says that in Colossians 3, and it's so important. And so, as we're here in 2 Corinthians, he's saying their, their desire is to serve the Lord. And our ambition, our desire is to serve the Lord. That's one of the reasons why we think it's important at Calvary to teach the whole counsel of God. Because we think if God put it in his 66 books by 40 authors over roughly 1,400 years, that it's valuable to teach. Are there things that are not particularly uh, politically correct in this book? There are. Am I going to try to figure out what the culture wants to hear, or am I going to say, this is what God has said? We're going to say, this is what God has said. Because he says our ambition, whether at home or absent, is to be pleasing to him, right? Because just so you know, what people think is going to change, it changes all the time, right? And so you want to please the Lord, because that's consistency. And why do we fear the Lord? We fear him because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed, rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here's the deal. I want you to hear me clearly. There's a great white throne judgment in Revelation 20. And those who stand before that are those who the books are opened. Their name is not in the Lamb's uh, book of life. And they are judged according to their deeds, and they are condemned according to their deeds. There is another judgment that is not the great white throne judgment. That is for non-believers, Revelation 20 and other places, but acutely Revelation 20. The other judgment that's for believers is standing before the Lord and having our works evaluated by Him. Okay? This is like that time when you sit down with your boss and they give you an evaluation. This is what you did. This is how you did it. Only it'll be the Lord evaluating us and it'll be here evaluating everything we did in in, in our flesh. Did we do... Okay, so you were teaching a Sunday school class. Okay, that's good. Were you doing it humbly just for the Lord? Then that's really good. But if you were doing it pridefully for yourself or to have an audience... Oh, that's not good, right? So he'll know your motivation. He'll know your heart. He'll know everything about it. And you'll be evaluated based on what you did for him while you were alive. This is the judgment that is called the Bema Seat. It's mentioned in other places in the scripture. I I do want to go to one quick one over in Romans chapter 14. But this is when people say, I'm going to stand before God and face him. As a Christian, this is what that is. And it, what it is, it's an evaluation of what you did for him while you were alive, right? And uh, there'll, be, there'll be gold, silver, and precious stones because it'll be tried by fire, and there'll be wood, hay, and stubble if you were serving yourself instead of serving the Lord. Romans 14, and I want to read a few verses there to further remind you of this very interesting truth. It says here in Romans 14, it says, why do you judge your brother, or again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? This is about inter-church issues. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for as it is written, as I live, 
says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will give praise to God, so that each one of us will give an account of himself to God. That's in verse 12. All right? So the point is, is that there's going to come a time when we stand before the Lord and what we've done for him in this life is evaluated, right? And that could be the volume of it and that could be the, and the quality of it, all right? So the Lord is going to evaluate. So we, we do walk in the fear of the Lord because we know our bodies are changing. We walk in the fear of the Lord because we know as we're seeking to please him that someday we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ or of God and have our work that we did on this earth evaluated. What's fascinating is Christ Jesus wrote seven letters to seven churches. It's in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 3. Guess how many of the seven churches had nothing negative said about them? Two. Only two. And it's kind of, it's a little bit disturbing when you read those letters because every one of them has areas of correction. So if you and I think we don't need any correction, well, then you think you're one of the two out of the seven, right? I, I, I'm probably one of the five out of the seven, and you are too, right? Because we want to stand before the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, I did, what, what did I do? Well, I did these things, and I did them for you, and I did them out of a heart to glorify you and not glorify myself. I did them out of a heart to glorify you and not make people think something of me. I did it out of a heart just for you, Lord. Those are the precious things we're going to give to him, right? But it's going to be evaluated. It's going to be evaluated. And, um, and that's going to be a time that we all have to stand before him. It's not for salvation. The great white throne judgment is for salvation for the unbelievers to show them that they are condemned. It is for evaluation of the work you did as a believer. Your judgment was taken on Christ on the cross, okay? But that doesn't mean today we don't walk in the fear of him. That doesn't mean today we don't live in light of him. Because he says in verse 11, therefore knowing the fear of the Lord, right? That links this whole passage, okay? So they fear the Lord. What do they do? We persuade men. Oh, but pastor, you, you don't want to share that verse with people because it may offend them. Oh, wait, wait. Do I, the fear of man is a snare, right? That's what the scripture says. He says he fears the Lord. So he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men but we are made manifest to God, and I, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. So he's saying here, we fear God, so we speak what God has told us to speak. We do what God has told us to do. We don't fear uh, man more than we fear God. And he says, we, in verse 12, we are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving an occasion to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. In other words, you can be proud knowing that Paul and his ministry companions are fearing God more than man and are speaking the truth as they ought to when they're given the opportunity to. And that's from the heart. So this is important to keep in, keep in mind of. that. Uh, so we think... Our bodies are temporary, so we have the promise of the resurrection. We walk by faith, not by sight, verses 6 through 10 and verse 11 through 15. You serve out of the fear of the Lord and your love for him, right? Why do you do what you do? Because you know God is just and God is going to reward those who diligently seek him, Hebrews eleven six, 6, and also because you love him. That's why you serve him, right? You don't serve him mechanically. Like, oh, I serve him because I don't want him to, you know, punish me. That's not why you serve God. You serve God because you love him. Because he loved you and he died for you. And then he gave you a pledge. So you're one of his kids. So you want to please him. You want to do something where he goes, I'm so proud of you, son or daughter. And so what he's saying here, he's saying that we fear the Lord more than we fear people. So we speak. And we got a pure heart. We're doing what the Lord wants us to do. And that's the thing is, 
is if, if, you, if you just get this straight in your head, I want to please God, everything else falls into place, right? There's all kinds of stuff you can do to please God. All kinds of stuff. <clears throat> I was watching a hockey game the other day. I know that may be hard for you to, to, to picture. And, um, and I looked up one of the players on this team that I've known for a long time. And I read on his Wikipedia page. And uh, he actually lived near where I used to live. And, um, and he's, his, on his Wikipedia page, he said his whole life he was taken to this Baptist church. And, uh, and he holds a Bible study with the, and a prayer time with the players that he plays with. And then I had a hard time rooting against him. I was like, oh, I like that guy, right? And, and why do I say that? I say that because it doesn't matter where you are, okay? Right? I, for those of you who are Browns fans, I'm sorry about your loss last night. The quarterback for the Texans absolutely loves the Lord. And he leads prayer times at every game. I don't pay attention to the NFL, but I like that. And I told a guy at work who's a Browns fan, I said, I'm going to have a hard time rooting for the Browns because the other quarterback really loves Jesus. And he said, oh, the Browns quarterback is really religious. I was like, yeah, we're having two different conversations. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know anything about the Browns quarterback. My point is, is that that's important, right? So the Lord, hey, you're on this big stage. What do you care about? Speak for Jesus Christ. Live for Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm just teaching, I'm just in the nursery Live for Jesus Christ. And you love those babies because you love Christ. Oh, I'm, t I'm teaching these little kids. You know, and they've got to have potty breaks and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm pulling my hair out. No, no, no. Down the road, they may look back and go, I remember that Sunday school teacher. That person changed my life because they loved me and they taught me about Jesus. You may have somebody like that in your life. Be that person. Be that older person that when a kid runs through the sanctuary, you love on them. And you point them to Jesus. And they go, there's something different about these people. They're very loving. Why is that? Oh, because the Lord. Because the Lord. Maybe you're not super loving by nature, right? Maybe you are. But then the Lord changes you. And you love and you serve, and you're like, <clears throat> you know, if you, and, and, and it's hard to get in here Monday through Thursday, because this place is a madhouse, right? But if you get invited in, because uh, we keep the doors locked for obvious reasons, you just see all over the place, all these kids, and you'll see Bibles open, and you'll see prayer time, and you'll see encouragement, and you'll see runny noses, and all kinds of, you know, like, like you know, and, and, and it's like, hey, man, our prayer is that they look and go, we were loved and we were taught the scriptures. And that as they grow up, they grow up in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, right? And so why do we do what we do? Because we love the Lord. We fear the Lord. We know the Lord's going to evaluate us one day. We know the Lord <clears throat> is going to look at you and say, what would you do with what I gave you? And we don't want to bury our talent. We want to use what God has given us it, with, with our gifting and our resources. For in Romans 14, it says this as well in verse 7. For not one of us lives for himself, <clears throat> not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again that he might be both Lord of the dead and of the living. So if you want to look in Romans 14, that's verses 7 through 9. Whether you are living or dead, you just serve the Lord. You live for the Lord. You do for the Lord, right? So until you die, until you break the tape, I, I want you to be serving the Lord. And I want to say something, and, 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 and I mean this. As somebody who grew up in the church and somebody who's pastored in churches and somebody who's seen a lot of people get mistreated, all right? I, I don't care about me. You guys, whatever you say about me or think about me, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't really care. I love the Lord. I serve the Lord first, okay? But man, I've seen a lot of people get mistreated. I can't tell you the number of pastors that when they get to a certain age and they don't have 
I don't know, for lack of a better term, like the good young guy vibe, they get put out to pasture. And I think there is no retirement as believers. Like, that guy has all kinds of gifting. That guy has all kinds of wisdom. He needs to sit in an elders meeting and help guide them. Because too often, churches want to just look young and be young. And, and, and that's, I'm not condemning having young people serve. I think that's great. But we want to look like the world and be young and hip. And then that guy who gets older, we just like ditch him. That's just, that's the world system. That's wrong. I remember talking to a guy who had so much more experience than I did. I was, I was 27 years old. I had no clue what I was doing. And he said, Peter, you're, you're really lucky because you're young. Churches will want you. He says, churches don't want old guys like me anymore. The guy was in his 60s. I was like, I looked at him and said, I don't know anything. You know everything. I said, I'm clueless. He said, they want young people. I'm not condemning that. I'm just saying, we need to not look like the world. All right? We need to let those who are gifted serve. We need to not tell seniors, you can retire now from service and you're not worthless any. You're not, you have no worth anymore. Absolutely not. Every age and stage has tremendous value. So if you're here today and you're like, I've timed out of serving the Lord, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. And you don't just need to do prayer, which is so valuable. There's things you can still do and still be active serving the Lord. Like, quite frankly, I want to die serving the Lord, okay? I don't want to go collect shells on a beach. I like beaches, probably more than I should. I don't like shells so much. What do you do when you collect them, right? I want to die. So, so, so we got to not mirror the culture. And that means if you're younger, you've got to give some respect to the older people in your life. And as, if you're older, you've got to realize the younger people are going to text you emojis that you're going to have to Google because you won't know what they mean, all right? I can't tell you the number of times I've had to text, I've had to Google things that my son has sent me that are just letters, right? I look and go, what does HBU mean? I, I don't know, Right? And then I have to Google, and I'm like, oh, yeah, how about you? Uh, how about you? Or, okay, okay, that's what he's asking me, you know? Okay, got it, got it, you know? So I'm just saying, like, you got to flex with each other. But Calvary's not going to be a place where people get, like, put out to pasture, all right? So if you're here today and you're like, I'm kind of older, I don't really have anywhere to serve, there's lots of places you can serve, all right? There's lots of things with children. There's lots of things with, with teens. There's lots of ways you can pray with people. There's lots of ways you can come alongside people and mentor. There's lots of things to do here, all right? <clears throat> um, and Paul, same thing. He just kept serving. John, who they tried, he's the only one of the disciples that did not die uh, a martyr's death. They tried to kill him, and he wouldn't die. And as an old man, he was going to church in Ephesus, and he was still mentoring and still encouraging the saints. All right? So, 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. That's exactly what I was just talking about. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him no longer in this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a, he, or you could say she there, is a new creature. All things have passed away. New things have come. Behold, new things have come. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 is a great verse to get your head wrapped around to say, I am not the person I was before I came to Jesus Christ. Okay, you don't need to think about the sin you committed. You don't need to think about who you were. You don't need to dwell on it. That literally, that person, like in baptism, is buried, and you're a new creature in Christ. New creation, all right? God has made you new, and that's why... In John 3.3, 3, it says you must be born again. That's a spiritual birth from above. And that's a, a spirit that is dead, that gets made alive. And when it does, what happened before then is under the blood of Christ and you're a new creation. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And this is that ministry we have as Christians of reconciliation. And what that means is 
not between people's groups, but between God and man. And when you present the gospel and say, there's a God who created you, you're in a sin condition, you can be made right with God through reconciliation through the cross, that's what you present. And he goes on to say that, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, going to the world and communicating Christ so they can know that there's forgiveness found in Christ. If you fear the Lord, that'll be your message, that Christ died to reconcile humanity, each individual, back to God. Therefore, we are ambassadors, right? We serve as heavenly citizens, as ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's the message. Be reconciled to God. And then the gospel is wrapped up in verse 21, and we're going we're gonna to stop there. I just want to say a few words after that, and then the worship team will come up. For he, that's God, made him Christ, who knew no sin, he's sinless, to be sin on our behalf. Christ took your sin on the cross, okay? That means all the horrible things humanity has done, Christ took that upon himself. I don't know if you've ever had to do anything disgusting, like reach into anything or do anything where you're like, this is so gross, right? It's like that times a thousand, okay? Because he had never known that sin, and now that sin got put on him, and when it did, from noon to three, the skies turned black because God literally turned his face from his son because they were separated for the first time ever because he now was a sin bearer. That's what happened. So when we tell people you need to be reconciled to God and Christ is a unique way because as a human race, he entered into it and he offered himself for you, it's unique. It's salvation that only comes through Christ. And, and he took your sin. Oh, you don't know what I've done. I don't, and I don't really need to, but Christ does, and he actually took it on himself. And when you go to God and say, please forgive me, it's because he took that sin on himself. So if you think it's cool to keep sinning, it's like you're throwing more stuff on Christ on the cross, right? That's why we say let's walk in holiness because sin's what put him on the cross, sin's, sin's why he was on the cross, and although he did it because he loved us, that's why he had to do it. Why did he do that? Took his sin on our behalf so that Always look at those, those two words when they're together. We might become the righteousness of God in him or in Christ. That's the fear of the Lord. I fear the Lord. I want to live for the Lord. I fear the Lord. I know this tent is earthly. I know it's passing away. I'm going to live for the Lord. I, I, I fear the Lord. I want to walk by faith. I fear the Lord. I want to speak the truth in love. I, I fear the Lord. I want to encourage people to be reconciled to God through Christ. Well, don't all religions lead to the same place? All roads don't lead to your house, do they? Like if you live south of the church, you can't start going north and think, I'll eventually get there. Won't happen. No, 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 no. No, there, there, there's one belief system where the perfect man died in our place and came back to life. And that's what we believe and that's Jesus Christ, and it's commonly referred to as the Christian faith, but it was called the way in the New Testament. So I want to ask you today, are, are you walking in fear of the Lord? Are you serving the Lord? What you think, what you do? Are you sitting here going, no, oh, you know, I could probably be more active. There's some people I could pray for. There's some stuff I could do. There's some people I could serve. Hey, it's a new year. We're not even out of January yet. You can hit the ground running, right? Before um, the Apostle Paul dies, he writes in 2 Timothy verse, in chapter 4, he says that the time of his departure is at hand. And he's about to be offered up like a drink offering. And a drink offering, they'd get the altar really hot, they'd pour the liquid over, and it would just turn into a vapor, right? 
And he also, in the scriptures, not he, but it says in James that our life is a vapor. And that's a really interesting picture of, I'm not about to be poured out. It's over, right? And really, sometimes when we live our lives, we feel like they're going to last forever, but they really aren't that long. And my grandmother used to have a saying in her kitchen, and it said, only one life will soon be passed, and some of you know where I'm going with this, and only what's done for Christ will last. I thought that is succinct, right? That's really good. So I'd encourage you today, it's a good time, 2024, we're kind of in January, you can just say, Lord, do I fear you? Am I walking for you, with you? Am I serving how you'd have me serve? Am I walking by faith and not by sight? And those are good challenges. Now, the worship team is going to come up. They're going to lead us in a song, and I'm going to pray for us as they do. Lord, we pray that we'll be walking with you in 2024 in a new, fresh way like we maybe we never have, walking by faith and not by sight. We pray that out of fear we'll serve you, Lord, because we love you, but knowing that one day we're going to stand before you and give an evaluation of the things we did on this earth. And Lord, we want to offer you gold, silver, and precious stones. So Lord, this year, do the changes in each one of our lives that need to happen so we can serve you in a way that will bring you the most honor and glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.